This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. The word church is used well over 100 times in the New Testament. It is obviously a very important word. But what exactly does it mean? Is the church merely a place of worship? Is it the sum of all religious denominations? Or is it something more personal and spiritual? Furthermore, how important is the church? And does Jesus have a church to which we must belong in order to be saved? Let's listen to John Moore as he leads us in our study on searching for truth about the church. Is this what you think of when you think of a church? That's what most people think of. And you know, even the dictionary defines the word church as a building, a building set apart or consecrated for public worship. But is the church simply a building made of wood or stone? Or is there something more? Indeed there is. For the church, the church built by Jesus Christ, was in existence long before this church building or any other church building or denomination or Christian organization was in existence. What then is the church? And what should our attitude be toward the church? As we search through the scriptures, the Word of God, our source for truth, let's see what we can discover. And as we do, let's answer three very important questions. Number one, what is the church? Number two, is the church essential? And then number three, must the church be unified? As we begin, let's turn our attention to our first question. The word church brings to mind many things for many people, but the Greek word ekklesia, from which the word church is derived, has a very interesting history and an important application in the realm of the New Testament. In most people's minds, the church is a building. The word translated church in our English New Testaments comes from a word that means the called out, speaking of the people. And one of the best definitions I know of the church is found in Acts 8.1 and Acts 9.1. Paul is persecuting the church, Acts 8.1. In Acts 9.1 it says that he's persecuting the disciples of the Lord. Therefore the church, the disciples of the Lord, same thing. Indeed, within the New Testament, that word church takes on a very significant meaning with some well-established parameters. It is first mentioned in the Gospel according to Matthew, where in chapter 16 of that great book, we find the Apostle Peter making an affirmation about Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In discovering the meaning of the word church, let's notice first of all that Christ indeed has a church. Number two, let's notice that Jesus would be the builder of his church. And number three, let's notice that Peter and the rest of the apostles would be given keys to the kingdom. Now in regard to this third point, we need to know that keys are symbolic of authority and that about a year after the Lord made His promise to build His church, we find that Peter and the rest of the apostles took these keys of authority and they opened the doors of the kingdom, thus establishing the church. This event took place on the same day as the Jewish celebration of Pentecost as recorded by the inspired writer Luke in Acts chapter 2. In reading through this chapter, we find that the twelve apostles were given power from on high when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them while waiting in a house in Jerusalem. Having no prior learning in some of these languages mentioned in verses 9 through 11, the apostles were nevertheless able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in various human languages to these individuals represented by these various ethnic groups and national entities. This gospel message consisted of a reference to Old Testament fulfillment about the Holy Spirit, a summary of the Lord's credentials, 
a message about the meaning and significance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and the revelation about the exaltation of Jesus to David's throne. Upon hearing this sermon, sincere and conscious pricked souls who were in need of salvation cried out in belief, asking, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Listen to what Peter told them to do to obtain the forgiveness or remission of sin. Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Here we find that after hearing the message of Peter, accepting that message, that sinners who wanted to be saved indeed were baptized. Well, what then did they become a part of? Those who were baptized, did they join a denomination? No, of course, none existed at that time. Well, what happened? And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Did you hear what Luke said was happening there? He said those that were being baptized were being added to those who were being saved. And then we find those that were being saved were being added to the church. They did not join a church. They weren't added to a denomination because, of course, at that time, none existed. Instead, as sinners were being baptized, they were being saved. And at the same time, Christ was adding those saved people to others whom he had saved. And collectively, they made up what were known as the church. To put it plainly, the church is the collectivity of the saved. And the saved make up what is known as the church. Throughout the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament, you will see that these saved individuals are identified in just this way, that is, as the church. As we continue to read throughout the entirety of the Bible, we also will discover that the word church is used to refer to these saved individuals in one of three ways. It is used in either a local sense, as in the church at Jerusalem, or in a universal sense, referring to the saved all over the world, such as Christ loved the church, or in a specific sense, when the Bible speaks of the saved coming together in an assembly for worship. In all three cases, the word church refers to those who have been saved. Now these saved individuals are in Scripture identified with some very descriptive and meaningful terms. These terms aid us in understanding the work and nature of these saved people, the church. For example, the saved are known as the church because as the Greek word for church reveals, they are the called out, called out of the world, out of darkness, and into God's spiritual light. The saved are also called the kingdom because when we think of a kingdom, we typically think of a king and loyal citizens and servants within that kingdom. As saved individuals, Christians live under the kingship of Jesus. They are under the rule and domain of Christ, the King. In addition to being known as the kingdom, the saved are also known as the temple. In pagan cultures, temples are usually thought of as a dwelling place or house for a god. In the Bible, we learn that the one true living God dwells within the church. His Holy Spirit takes up His abode within each Christian. But further, they are also known as the household of God. In the New Testament, the word household often had reference to a family unit with a father, mother, sisters, and brothers. Likewise, the church should be thought of as a family, with God as our heavenly father, Christ as our elder brother, and the saved our brothers and sisters. But still further, not only are the saved referred to as the household of God, they are also called the body. Just like the human body has a single head and various members, so the saved 
has as its head Christ Jesus and its parts of the body, individual Christians. Like a human body works in connection and relationship with all parts of the body, showing unity and singularity, so the saved, the church, is a single body which reveals unity and singularity. In fact, it is this last designation, the body, coupled with a reference from 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, that so clearly makes the point that the church is the saved, a people belonging to Christ. Listen now to what the Apostle Paul says in the following two passages. Fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Yes, friend, the body and the church are one and the same. And because this is true, the Apostle Paul referred to Christians at Corinth as the body of Christ. Those Christians in the city of Corinth were known as the church. They were the church of Christ in that community. So in answering our question about what is the church, we must conclude that the church is not a building, it's not a place for worship, but rather the church is a people, a people belonging to God. To further illustrate the nature and essence of the church, let's observe what the Apostle Paul wrote to a young evangelist by the name of Timothy. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. When Paul made reference in this passage to the house of God, was he speaking of a literal or physical house? No, of course not. He was speaking of a spiritual house, a house built by God, that is, the church, the people of God. The church, as God's house, was built upon the solid rock of the Lord's deity. After Peter made his great confession that Jesus was the Christ, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Now, according to Ephesians 2 verse 20, Jesus is the chief cornerstone as well and his holy apostles and prophets are the foundation. In 1 Peter 2 verse 5, we learn that Christians are the living stones which make up the spiritual house. And then, according to 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. It upholds the word of God. It has the responsibility of going into all the world to preach the truth, the good news about Christ. Jesus Christ is also the door into this house. He is the door and the means by which men must enter in order to have eternal life. Leading up to that door are the steps of salvation, which each sinner must climb in order to enter the church. This then is the basic structure and framework of the church. It is the collectivity of Christians that are built upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and his holy apostles, the foundation. So again, what is the church? The church is the saved. It is the body of baptized believers. It is the body of Christ, the kingdom of God, the house of God, and the temple of God. Now that we have determined what the church is, let's ask our second major question. And that is, is this church essential and important? Occasionally, I hear some people say, give me Jesus, but not the church, or give me the man, but not the plan. I've also heard some people say, you don't really need to be a member of the church in order to go to heaven. But is this really true? In a letter written to the church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul wrote, and stress the essential nature and the value of the church in terms of our relationship to God. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. 
From this passage, we not only learn that there was once a division between Jew and Gentile, but we also learn that a division once existed between God and man. According to passages like Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, and Romans 6, verse 23, sin separated a person from God. It is sin that makes us an enemy of God. But the Bible also teaches that because of the love of God, because of the good news about Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, we learn that we can be a friend of God again. We learn that we can be reconciled to God. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. This term reconciled or reconciliation refers to separate parties or factions being brought back together, being made one. In Ephesians 2 verse 16 we learn that the division between God and man that existed because of sin can be made one, that is they can be reconciled in the one body of Christ. Now earlier in chapter 1 the Apostle Paul referred to the church as the body of Christ when he said, God made Jesus to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Christ's church and the body are one and the same. And so if we want to be saved, if we want to be reconciled to God, then we must be in the body, which of course is the same thing as saying we must be in the church. And so yes, the church is important. It is essential. If we want to be saved, reconciled to God, we must be in that body, the body of Christ. But now, let's go further into the book of Ephesians and discover some additional reasons as to why the church is so valuable and so important. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. From this passage we learn two very important points. First of all, let's observe that the church is the manifold wisdom of God. That is to say, it is a reflection or an example of God's wisdom. From its unique organization to its unique form of worship, the church is the greatest institution to ever have been established. An example of how great this institution is can be seen in its cross-cultural and cross-national fellowship. This unique fellowship can be better understood against the backdrop of what we read earlier about a division existing between Jew and Gentile. In Ephesians 2 verse 14, Paul alluded to this division when he spoke of a wall of separation. The wall that Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 in one sense was a literal wall. Uh, we find that uh, this wall had been erected within the Herodian temple complex and it was designed to prevent the Gentiles from uh, venturing into the temple sanctuary and its inner courts. Uh, what we must recognize is that the, the Gentiles were not offered or not extended a true fellowship with the Jews as a result of this barrier. And not only that, it was symbolic of the fact that uh, the Gentiles were not given equal access to God and to His spiritual blessings and promises under the old law. The eradication of that division had been prophesied by two Old Testament prophets by the name of Isaiah and Daniel. Both had prophesied about God's plan to eradicate that wall and remedy the division between Jew and Gentile by means of Christ's death upon the cross and through God's kingdom, the church. But Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 uh, conveyed the idea that through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ that this middle wall had been removed and now both Gentiles and Jews have equal access uh, to the spiritual blessings and promises of God regardless of nationality, of social class, of political affiliation, education level or gender. 
we can all have access to God by the body of Christ, which is His church. The church, then, is an all-inclusive body of people which transcends or rises above race, nationality, and ethnicity. The church, as God's kingdom, includes people from all over the world. And, as Isaiah said, all nations would flow into it. When today, a person through faith in Christ Jesus is baptized into Christ, they are thereby clothed with Christ and become a part of a family where divisive lines of race and status are eliminated. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Yes, the church is a shining example of how God brings people together. Through baptism into Christ, people of all races become one. They become a part of a brotherhood devoid of economic status or political standing. As a family, the church exhibits a mutual care and concern for its members. According to the Bible, it is a place where there is a single heart and a generous spirit of love. Especially for those who have been abandoned or mistreated by their earthly family, the church is a haven of happiness and goodwill with many brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers to help foster and care for its spiritual children. Indeed, the church reflects the wisdom of God, and we give thanks for it. But in addition to it reflecting the wisdom of God, let's notice from Ephesians 3 verse 11 that the church is essential because it is within the eternal purpose of God. The establishment of the church was according to God's eternal plan. It was in His mind long before the world ever began. The church was not, as some have contended today, an afterthought or a last-minute decision made by the Lord when He was allegedly unable to establish His kingdom. The church, as God's kingdom, as we learned earlier, are one and the same. And the kingdom had been planned by deity. It had been prophesied by the prophets, predicted by Jesus, and established by God. It was all according to a marvelous plan which saw its fulfillment in the first century and is still being realized today. The kingdom, as revealed in the Bible, was in existence during the first century. In passages like Colossians 1.13, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 5 and Revelation 1 verse 9, we read that Bible writers spoke of the kingdom being in existence during their lifetime. According to the prophet Daniel, we find that that kingdom was to come into existence during the Roman Empire. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. From the context of this passage, we learn that this phrase, in the days of these kings, refers to the Roman Empire. Daniel had prophesied that four successive world empires would control the region of Palestine. It was during that fourth empire, which history records as the Roman Empire, with its emperors or kings, that the church of Christ, and thus the kingdom of God, was established. But now let's even go further into the book of Ephesians and learn one more thing about the essential nature and the value of God's church. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now there are many beautiful truths revealed in this passage, but in light of our question about the importance and value of the church, let's notice that Jesus loves the church and he is the Savior of the body. Now friend, if Christ, our great example, loved the church, shouldn't we love the church as well? Absolutely. The church of Jesus Christ ought to be the most important thing in our lives. So I ask you, friend, do you love the church of Jesus as Christ loved the church? Since Christ loved the church enough to shed his blood for it and to die on its behalf, 
Shouldn't we therefore want to be a part of it? Indeed, as 2 Timothy 2 verse 10 says, salvation is in Christ. And since the body of Christ is the same thing as the church of Christ, would we not therefore need to be in the church in order to be saved? Certainly we would. We must be in the body of Christ to be saved. Thus, friend, we can clearly see that the church is not only important and valuable, but it is also absolutely necessary and essential. But now, let's notice one final point in the book of Ephesians about the church. And as we do, this will bring us to our last and final question. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. After hearing what Paul said, we must conclude that just as there is only one God and one spirit and one faith, there is also only one body. Now, since the church and the body are equal to the same thing, as revealed in Ephesians chapter 1, 22 through 23, it must be understood that there is therefore only one church. Listen now to what Jesus says about this one church. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, friend, did Jesus say he would build churches as in the plural form, or did he say he would build his church as in the singular form? That's right. He said he would build his church, singular. And yet today, there are so many different churches in existence. And these churches teach differing ideas about how to become a Christian. They have different ideas and beliefs about moral issues and about how to organize the church and how to worship. If you were to examine, for example, a directory of churches in your country, you would soon come to realize that there are so many divergent names and types of churches. Among those who are claiming to be Christians, you would also recognize that many of these churches are divided. But do you think that this is pleasing to God? Is it acceptable to have so many churches? Well, what about the church Jesus promised to build? Should this kind of division be tolerated? Is it acceptable to divide up the one body of Christ by creating and establishing man-made churches or denominations? Should Christians within the one body of Christ separate themselves off from other Christians within that body by wearing a different name or a peculiar name or adopting doctrines that are not found in the Bible and adopting creed books and ideas and philosophies that are nowhere mentioned in the Bible? Let's answer those questions. And in particular, let's ask number three, must the church be united? In today's world, there is a great deal of division among those who profess to follow Jesus. The acceptance and toleration of this division is often rationalized on the basis of a concept known as denominationalism. But what exactly is denominationalism? The word denominationalism simply means to name something. And when you separate yourself in any group, you actually denominate it. Uh, you ask someone what kind of a Christian he is, he might tell you, I'm this particular kind of Christian. And he's denominating what he is. And so what happened here is denominationalism split Christianity into so many bodies that it's nearly impossible to name all of them. Someone has estimated over 600 in this country alone claiming to be Christians but naming themselves different because they're following different creeds or different doctrines or different dogma. And so to denominate is to split or to break up the church that Jesus died for and paid for with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. So denominationalism promotes the idea of division and sectarianism. Interestingly enough, this concept or this idea is not even mentioned in the Bible. In fact, the idea of dividing over a man-made doctrine or the notoriety of men is absolutely forbidden. It's condemned. Consider, for example, what was happening at the church at Corinth. In the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, Luke tells us that while Paul was on one of his missionary journeys, 
he helped to establish the church in the city of Corinth. From Corinth, he eventually made his way over to Asia Minor, where he worked in establishing the church at Ephesus. While in Ephesus, Paul received word that there were some problems occurring in the body of Christ at Corinth. One of the problems had to do with a division among its members over a preference for preachers. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each one of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. When Paul had heard of these problems, he wrote, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the book of 1 Corinthians. And in that letter, he condemned the practice of division. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Sadly, some in the church at Corinth began dividing over a preference for preachers. After being baptized, some were saying, Well, I am of Paul. And others were saying, I am of Cephas. And some were saying, I am of Christ. And yet Paul wrote and denounced this sinful division by asking three very important questions. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The answers to these questions are obvious. First of all, no, Christ is not divided. In Mark 3, 22 through 26, Jesus stressed the unified nature of his essence. And then number two, the answer is no again. Paul was not crucified for them. And then number three, they were not baptized in the name of Paul, but instead, according to Matthew 28, verse 19, sinners are baptized in the name of Christ. So based on these criteria, would it have been wrong for Christians to call themselves Paulinites? Would it have been a sin to name the church after Paul? Yes, it would have been wrong. And yes, it would have been a sin against God. Well, what if today in the church there was a well-known preacher by the name of Alex Campbell who was himself a powerful and dynamic proclaimer of the Word of God? And let's say that he was a well-educated Bible scholar who was responsible for converting thousands upon thousands to Christ. If we, in seeking to honor him, began wearing the religious name Campbellite, do you think this would bring glory to God? Do you think it would be acceptable to God? Not according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But rather, in order to call ourselves a Campbellite, three things would have to be true. Number one, Christ would have to be divided. Number two, you would have to be baptized in the name of Alex Campbell. And number three, Alex Campbell would have to be crucified for you. Thus, in calling yourself a Campbellite, you would be dividing the body of Christ and would end up bringing glory to Alex Campbell instead of bringing glory to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 31, Paul said, If anyone glories, let him glory in the Lord. Peter said, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf, that is, in the name Christian. Now, friend, if it were wrong to divide the body of Christ over a preference for preachers, would it not be wrong to divide the body of Christ over creeds or man-made doctrines? Would it not be wrong to divide the body of Christ by the wearing of unauthorized religious names for either ourselves or for the congregation? This church may not teach the same thing as this church, but according to denominationalism, they're both the church of Christ. Scripture teaches us, however, that there is one body, one church, and that that church teaches the same thing uniformly. And that's really what we need to strive to do today, speak as the oracles of God and not differentiate and denominate ourselves into a number of different groups, all claiming to be from the one body. Friend, the unity of the church is emphasized again and again throughout the New Testament. And we must therefore not be guilty of dividing the body of Christ. Listen now to Jesus 
as he prayed for the unity of all believers. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now listen to the Apostle Paul as he instructed the church in maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now let's notice that not only does God demand unity, but also division and sectarianism is condemned. Notice in the following passage that division is classified as a work of the flesh, which must not be practiced nor tolerated. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, wraths, factions, divisions, parties, envyings, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I forewarn you, even as I did forewarn you, that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Yes, division is condemned. And as you heard just a moment ago from passages like Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we must endeavor to maintain the unity found in the body of Christ. We must speak the same things. We must be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. But in order for that to happen, each of us are going to have to give up those things that are not found in the Bible. We're going to have to give up unauthorized religious practices or the wearing of names that are not found in the Bible. And we're going to have to return to the Bible for a thus saith the Lord for all that we do and say. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. To do something in the name of the Lord is to do something with his permission and his approval. So are you seeking the Lord's approval? Are you in his church? Are you wearing a religious name which brings glory to Christ? Are you living and worshiping in a way that is authorized or acceptable to Christ? Friend, are you striving to promote unity in the body of Christ by going to the Bible and doing things according to God's will and God's way? You know, it would be absolutely wonderful if sincere truth seekers everywhere stopped wearing man-made religious names and gave up their creed books and confessions of faith and all unbiblical practices and became just a church of Christ as revealed in the New Testament. Friend, not only would this be wonderful, but we must make every effort to make this possible. So in answering our third major question, must the church be unified, we have to answer with a resounding yes. Just as we have learned in this lesson that the church is the body of Christ who are the saved, and that number two, the church is important, essential, and necessary, we have also learned that the church must be unified. These three points are fundamental to the faith. Indeed, they are a part of the blessed gospel of Christ. They are part of the truth, the word of God, the truth that can set us free from the shackles of false religious practices and man-made churches. Indeed, friend, my hope is that you will accept and obey this truth regarding what the Bible teaches about the church that Jesus built. Remember, the truth and only the truth can set you free. I pray that you will obey the truth and become just a Christian, become a part of God's family, the church. And the truth shall set you free. God's word is true.